Hey, man. Thank you for joining me here. This is just a little video uh, thought uh, journal type style. I don't know how you want to call it, but uh, we're just going to look at when do we need Jesus? You know, give me Jesus when dot, dot, dot. Man, the truth is we need him all the time. The text verse here is Proverbs 18, 24. A man that hath friends much must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And all we're going to do is look at the two parts here. Number one, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. You know, the first part of this verse, you know, I don't know. Have you ever thought about this? Being a good friend to Jesus. How can we be a good friend to him? You know, we know he's a good friend to us. We know who he is and what he's done for us. Amen. If you've studied God's word any length of time, if you've been saved, what does the Bible say? Taste and see. Amen. How good God is. How blessed you are how blessed I am. I was praising God yesterday uh, to the congregation, telling them I feel favored in my life. I praise God for the favor that he has in my life. I mean, things I've been through, even the bad times are good with Jesus. Amen. That'll preach. He's so good. And so we know he's good. So let's start here with how can we be a good friend to Jesus? Again, I want to mention too, a lot of times when I'm preaching about drawing close to God, people want to think, Oh, well, is this a requirement? No. I mean, we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone, specifically what he did on the cross at Calvary. We're we're saved by grace, amen. And that salvation that we have should bring about in us fruit, that we should be not just fruit of winning souls and stuff, but how about fruit of being close to Jesus? By the way, if you're close to Jesus, he'll use you to win souls. First part of this verse, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. How do we show ourselves friendly to Jesus? Well, I, I sometimes every once in a while, I like to take something in the world and I like to take that list and then use it to showcase something godly. Uh, and I don't know why, but it's just kind of just, I, I guess the way it is, is, you know, as a Christian, you look at the things of God as the highest level, right? And sometimes people will, you know, uh, maybe get lost in some of it, the theology behind it or whatever it may be, but everyone can understand some of the basic tenets of good friendship. So I took psychology today that sounds like a reputable source i took a list of what they said and they do it um they wrote it about being a good friend they wrote it as i am i am trustworthy i'm honest etc so that's why it says it like that i just took this list from psychology today i am trustworthy so apparently a good friend is trustworthy that makes sense right and so if we are a good friend to jesus can jesus trust you and what i mean by that is can he trust you to be obedient or are you disobedient rebellious lacking faith It's easy to fool man. Hey, you could fool me. If you you came to me and said, I'm a big time Christian, I'd believe you. I'd take you at your word unless there was something that was evident that wasn't good. I would say, okay, well, maybe there's not fruit there, but otherwise I'll take you at your word. But Christ looks upon the heart. Amen. The word, it's it's a thought. uh, It's a discerner of our thoughts, of our heart. Amen. And we know Jesus is the word. So can Jesus trust you? Can he trust you to be obedient to him? You know, if we are a good friend to Jesus, we should be trustworthy. And that means that we're not flaky. We're not um, wishy-washy. We're not lukewarm Christians. We're not here, there, and everywhere. We're not on fire for God one day, and the next day we don't know who God is. We want him to trust us. Again, not because we have to fulfill some kind of law, but because we want to. We want to be a good friend to Jesus. Are you trustworthy? And I think that that's something that we know deep down whether we are or not. And I think it's something we all can work on, being a good friend to the Lord, being trustworthy to him, which just simply means that we are consistent. I am honest with others. Are we honest with Jesus? Or is there something we're hiding from him? How can we be a good friend to Jesus if we are acting hypocritical or if we're hiding something, if we're not being truthful? You know, when I was in school, I had some friends, quote unquote, and they had an inner circle within those friends, there was an inner circle where they would tell each other secrets and stuff. And I was not in that inner circle. Now I'm sure there was good reason. I probably wouldn't have kept the information quiet, but either way, it kind of hurt me. I never felt like I was good friends with them because they were hiding something from me. And if I was their good friend, why would they do that? Are you honest with Jesus? Are you hiding something from him? You know, if we want to be a good friend to the Lord, we need to be honest with him. God does not expect perfection, but I believe he does expect honesty. And that idea comes through when we repent before God. We ask God to forgive us. We're not like, God's not going to say, okay, 
in order for, to be forgiven, you must climb 100 hills. No, God will forgive us. The Bible says he's, he's willing and able to forgive us, that he desires for all to come to repentance. God wants it to forgive us, whether it's a big sin, whether it's a little sin, anything in between. Um, I'm to the point where if I say something I think might not be appropriate or I'm, I'm thinking about something, whatever, I go to God immediately and I, I ask him to forgive me, to point out if it's wrong. Again, almost like real-time repentance. That would be a good message, amen. Go to God right away. Be honest with him. And I believe that's all he wants is us to have faith in him and be honest with him. Amen. Uh, to, to, you were saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. We're justified by faith. And part of faith is simply trusting him. I am generally very dependable. Do you stay close to Jesus or are you coming and going? Again, um, are we dependable? Can God trust us with something? You know, you want to do something from God for God, but you know, you get yoked up in the ways of the world and it's very hard. Uh, and the Bible talks about this in the scripture, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And I can think of an instance, a man in the ministry, and he generally wanted to do something for God, but he also wanted to be big in a certain area of the world. And unfortunately, that ministry really suffered because we need to be dependable. And I guess the term might be sold out to God, as in people, when they look at you, do they say that person is a Christian tried and true? Or do they say, depends what day? Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Depends, is it morning or is it night? Uh, you know, I always hear old time preachers talk about how uh, this person is the same on Saturday night as they are on Sunday morning. Would that be true for you? Are we dependable? I am loyal to the people I care about. Are you loyal to the Lord? Are you sticking close to him? You know, again, this is all biblical because this is this is all from psychology today, but I can think of scripture for pretty much every point here. I am loyal to the people I care about. Are you loyal? Think about that. You know, I think it was John 6, 66, 666, uh, devil's number there. When all these people were following Jesus to see the miracles, to eat the free food, so to speak, to get all the benefits. And then he starts talking about some tough spiritual truths about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And many, the Bible says in John 6, 6, 6, walked with him no more. They weren't loyal. You know, loyalty is not tested when things are good. It's easy to be loyal to somebody when they're doing well and there's a benefit for you. It's much harder to be loyal to someone when everything is not going well. Amen. And so maybe there's times in your life when you feel like God should be blessing you and he's not. If anything, he's allowing bad things to happen here and there and everywhere. And your faith is being tested. Hey, guess what? Are you loyal? Are you loyal? A good friend to Jesus, you're going to be loyal. And again, our text verse here. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. We want to be close to the Lord. We, we must do our part too, I believe. I'm easily able to trust others. Do you trust Jesus? A good friend will trust him. You know, another word for trust is faith, is it not? Taking God at his word is your hope and your faith in him alone. You know, to, to be a good friend to the Lord, you have to have uh, that trust level, that trust factor where you trust him. And that can be difficult when maybe there's a scripture that's difficult for you to handle. One that is advising you to do something you don't want to do. I'll give a personal example. As I got into the scriptures in my, uh, I guess it'd be early thirties, there's a lot of con uh, content, if you will, words in there, chapters, verses, et cetera, addressed in the new Testament to like submitting to Christ, being obedient to Christ, taking up your cross. And I'm like, Hmm, this doesn't sound good. Well, what about this thing that I wanted to do that has nothing to do with that? What, what about this thing that I wanted to do that would have been opposed to that? It's very difficult. The idea is almost like wrestling with God as Jacob wrestled with God. Amen. We are to trust Jesus and have faith in him so that when we are commanded in his word to do things, we're open to do it. And we are trusting him that he has the best interest for us. Romans 8, 28 tells us all things work together for good to those that love the Lord, to those that are called according to his purpose. So as we trust God, we're led by God and we're blessed by God. And that's a fruitful cycle. But that cycle does not start with a blessing. It starts with trusting. And that can be scary and difficult. But that's being a good friend to Jesus. I experience and express empathy for others. We often talk about this idea of having empathy for the poor and the needy and so forth. And that's very good. And that's biblical as well. 
But do we have empathy for what God did for us? Do we understand his passion? We understand his sacrifice. We understand that without his blood, we couldn't be saved and that it had to come to the blood, that it wasn't something that could be done lightly. That, that there was, when we read about the crucifixion in the scriptures, about him being mocked and ridiculed and beaten and, and, and whooped and bleeding and given vinegar and gall and having his beard plucked out one by one and all of these instances that just make you wince and say, oh, it's the most brutal death anyone's ever Ever suffered? Do we have empathy? Do we understand his passion? I remember some, uh, some singing group. I hate that I don't remember who they are, but there was a singing group many years ago that came to our church. And I don't even know if it was Christmas time, but they were singing about Mary and watching Jesus on the cross. And they actually even had a little drama where they had people go through and act different parts and stuff. And uh, I just was losing. I'm like, tears coming down my face. My heart was broken trying to think about what that would have been like for her to see her son there, her, you know, as she viewed him as earthly son, but also her Lord on the cross. Because we know Mary was there, right? Jesus gives Mary uh, to the disciple he loved, to John. He said, this is your mother now, right? Uh, And so we see this empathy is so important. Being a good friend, you have to have empathy, you know, and, 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 and by the way, that's a good litmus test. I've, I've, I've done that very kind of like quietly where I might bring something up to somebody. I'm not sure if they're a friend of mine or not, and I'll see if they care at all. You know, do they care at all? Cause if they don't care at all, they just throw out that issue that you might bring up that you have, but then they want you often to be empathetic towards them. That's not good. Well, how would the Lord feel if we are always bringing up issues we have to him and we never have empathy for what he did on the cross? And that empathy will lead us to a deeper faith, lead us to be a better witness and so forth. I'm able to be non-judgmental. Are you able to suffer and still trust Jesus? Many people want to put a grudge against the Lord. Unfair, okay? They want to put a grudge against the Lord when they're lost in their sin, If they're saved, if they don't like how things are going, uh, if they have a plan, um, if you look up the definition of like uh, frustration, I think it's expectations not being met. And I think it's a great definition. for. I don't know if that's definition or not. That's my definition. Okay. You're frustrated. You expected something. It didn't happen. A great example is like, uh, I love to like, you know, go on little day trips or go on a little weekend trip or something, not missing church. Okay. I'm the preacher. I'll be at church. Amen. But you know, for the one night or something, whatever it is. And I'm like, okay, we're going to leave it, you know, 730 in the morning. And we've got, you know, five people in our household. Amen. And there, nobody's leaving at 730 in the morning and it's 830. It's 930. It's 10 AM. And we're pulling out of the driveway and I'm frustrated because my expectation was here and it was not met. Okay. And so now am I going to judge everybody and say, oh, they're against me or whatever it is, or am I going to be able to just deal with it? Right. And as we go through the hardships of life, much harder than that silly example, but as we go through the hardships of life, do we trust Jesus or are we just, uh, you know, holding bitterness there as a good friend, we have to be non-judgmental. Amen. Again, oftentimes this good friendship is tested in difficult times. Our character is tested in difficult times. I'm a good listener. Do you spend time in prayer in his word? God does want to talk to you and no, he's not going to just show up and knock on your door and speak to you audibly. I don't think. How does he, how do you hear from God? You read his word, you pray, you read his word, you pray, you think about what's in his word, you pray, you meditate upon his word. And I don't like that word meditation too much because the, the idea of emptying your mind, no, fill your mind with scriptures, spend time in his word and the Lord will speak to your heart and your mind as to what he wants you to know. And the Bible says to be quick to hear, slow to speak. God wants a friend that is a good listener. We need to be that way. I'm supportive of others in their good times. Do you give him praise in good times? I'm amazed at some Christians that get so blessed and they don't, they forget about God and they're so blessed. You know, they they have some huge success and they can't even bother to say a testimony. They can't bother to even mention his name. We tell our kids, if they get a little toy, whatever it is, hey, every good, the Bible says every good, perfect gift comes from God. Amen. Every good thing comes from God. I'm supportive of others in their bad times. You know, when you go through hard times, are you ashamed of him? Amen. Are you ashamed of him when when it would uh, disadvantage uh, you? Amen. When his name brings reproach to you, are you ashamed? The Bible says if you're ashamed, he'll be ashamed of you. Amen. Again, I can bring scripture up for every single one of these. I'm self-confident. 
Are you confident in the Holy Spirit living within you that he's given you? Are you confident? Amen. I'm self-confident. We aren't to be confident in ourselves. We are to be confident in what he brings to us through the work of the Holy Spirit. That's how we know we're saved. The Bible calls the Holy Spirit the earnest uh, down payment or deposit. Amen. It is what we get, amen, uh, to show us that we are saved and what is to come. And we should be confident in that Holy Spirit. And we shouldn't grieve the Holy Spirit. We should be living to enrich the Holy Spirit, not grieving the Holy Spirit. I am usually able to see humor in life. Can you laugh at your circumstances? You know, oftentimes the best thing you can do uh, when something really bad happens or the devil's attacking or something ridiculous is almost laugh at it. Laugh at the idea that, you know what, God's sovereign and, you know, guess what? This He's allowed this to happen. Isn't that interesting? Whatever it is, you know, you get in a traffic jam, you know, and you don't, and it's like the worst possible time to be in a traffic jam. Are you able to just laugh at it? Or are you going to get bitter towards God, you know, about whatever it is? Are you going to distance yourself from God? Some people can be quietly bitter. You know, there was a phrase last year about quiet quitting and people were like, in their mind, just giving up on work. I bet there's Christians out there that are quiet quitting on God in their mind. They're just going afar off from him because they don't love their circumstances. God wants us to have a self uh, sense of humor, you know, and be able to see his hand in our lives. Amen. And just to see what, you know, by the way, that's a good sign. If you're seeing things happening in your life that all you can do is laugh, that means that the Lord is at work in your life. Amen. That you're able to see the Lord at work in your life, that you are able to laugh sometimes at your circumstances because they are so interesting or ironic or whatever it may be. I am fun to be around. You know, do you serve him and live and give with cheer or are you gloom and doom? There are many Christians that I hear with their head hung low. They're acting like they have to sacrifice everything just to be a Christian. Look, the Christian life is the best life. Amen. And the Bible tells us, you know, when you fast, don't go with like that pouty face. Let people think that you're not fasting at all, that God loves a cheerful giver, you know, that we are to just love the Lord and and enjoy this Christian life is the best possible life. I lived in the world for 30 years. I know exactly what the world has to offer and it's terrible. You know, the Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. That's true. And guess what comes after that? You get paid. You know what the wages of sin? That That's death. The wages of sin is death wages of sin or death. We, 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 we die spiritually. We get far off from God when we live in sin. Everything that's promised in this life lets down and disappoints. Everything that God gives us is good and wonderful. Amen. And if the spirit of God is there, you could have two, three people sitting in a room, staring at a table with a coffee cup and be happier than the happiest person on earth. And if the spirit is not get there, you could have every accoutrement, every rich, every dainty thing in the world, and you'd be miserable because you won't know what true joy is. So we should be fun to be around. We should be happy. And and look, if anyone knows me, they know that there's times that that I'm not happy. (laughs) Amen. I get frustrated down and out. Amen. Um, We had some missionaries staying here recently. (laughs) I won't say their name, but one of them, they called him Angry Bird because he was always mad. And look, and I know exactly what they're saying because he's, you know, I'm the same way sometimes. like frustrated about something, a work thing or whatever. But at the end of the day, we just have to praise God. We got to be fun to be around. You know, nobody wants to be around that whiny, miserable person. Amen. Nobody wants that. So to be a good friend, we got to be fun to be around. You'd be excited, uh, you know, when you see an individual that you know is going to be fun to be around. That's something about how God would have us to be, to be happy, to have joy in him, no matter our circumstance. And when we tie our joy to God and we, and he's our anchor and we don't tie our joy to the circumstances of this world, we can be happy no matter our circumstance. I met a janitor once at a grocery store who came to a food bank to pick up groceries because he was too poor to get all that he needed. And he was singing the, literally singing the praises of God. He was practically dancing for God and he was a joy to be around. And the world would have said he should have been so upset about this, that, and the other, and he could care less because he was praising God. We need to have that kind of joy. Amen. And secondly here, so we got the first part, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And secondly here, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Who's that friend that sticketh closer than a brother? That's Jesus. Amen. And when we think of our brother, our earthly brother, or my brother growing up, um, year and a half older than me. Everything my brother did, I wanted to do what he did. Amen. I looked up to him. Uh, I just, you know, that, you know, we, 
we could just tell each other's thoughts. Hey, Amen. He knew how to push my buttons. That's for sure. And I'm sure I knew how to push his buttons. But uh, yeah, I mean, I remember being in church one time and he was out for a bike ride. And uh, I remember to tell my wife, you know, something happened. And I called him. He said, yeah, I just fell off the bike, you know, and it's weird. We're not twins, but clo closeness of a brother is very close. I know Jenny and CJ, my two youngest, I mean, they're uh, 10 and a half months apart. Amen. And they are best friends. They're super close. Yes, they fight all the time too, but they're very, very close. And, and we look at the closeness of a brother. We look at Jesus sticking closer than that. So we need Jesus today more than ever because Jesus sticks closer than a brother. Our earthly brother may let us down, may go astray, may deceive us. You know, think of Jacob and Esau. The Lord loved Jacob and hated Esau. Amen. And it, that goes very deep if you look at uh, the people that came from Esau and all the problems there. But you know what? The earthly brother, forget that. The heavenly brother that sticketh closer than anyone else is Jesus Christ. You know, he's not just our Lord, though he is. He's not just our Savior, though he is. He's not just our teacher, though he is. He's not just our master, though he is. He's also our friend. Amen? Our friend. It's, it's beyond comprehension how the God of the universe could be our friend. The Bible says, I think it's John 1, that God made everything. Jesus made everything, and there was nothing that was made that wasn't made by him. Jesus made it all. That God, Jesus Christ, is our friend for those that have been saved, born again. The idea is that once we're saved by the blood of Jesus, by the way, by his sacrifice, his perfect sacrifice on the cross at Calvary and being risen from the grave, as we believe on Jesus, the Bible tells us what? that we are reconciled to God, you know, that we are made right with God, that there's no condemnation to those that love the Lord, those that are not taking part in sin, you know. We are close to him. We're friends with him. So when, when do we say, give me Jesus? And I've just thought of 10 here quickly. When we feel like we can't make ends meet. Now, I don't know where this is on your list, but oftentimes it's near the top of mind, especially being a small business owner and all these other things and, you know, being involved in everything uh, that comes with, you know, having a, I was going to say like a family, I don't know what you say, but yeah, being a, being a dad and trying to, you know, pay for a house, car, food, stuff, get it, you get it. We feel like we can't make ends meet. You got to go to the Lord. He understands you know, he said that, you know, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but I don't have anywhere to lay my head, to paraphrase. He had asked Peter to show him a penny, amen. He, he didn't have any earthly riches. He came of no good report. He came uh, uh, of, of no, no good report. I think it was Nathan that said, uh, what good can come from Nazareth? He came from Nazareth, amen. A little know-nothing town. Reminds me of King's Mountain, by the way. <laughs> no offense to King's Mountain. There's some things going on here. There's a donut shop here, amen. But, uh, but uh, you know. But we feel like we can't make ends meet. We feel like no matter what we do, you know, something always comes up. And I'm not speaking just from personal experience. And we talk to some missionaries and stuff. It's hard. It's hard sledding out there. You know, Brother Keith at WHPY radio station we're on, you know, they, they, they've they been doing a share -a I think, for 30 years. I think 30 years. And they've never once hit their goal. Never once have they raised enough funds. that they, And they, they're asking literally for $200 a day for like half the year or something. That's not a lot to run a radio station. And never once in 30 years they meet their goal. I spoke to a sweet lady at Children Baptist Home. I don't think she reminds me repeating this. A big, huge organization here. Uh, in the Carolinas, as well as other places, I think they have an international ministry as well. And they are, uh, they're a foster care ministry. They're literally a children's home. Uh, they do foster care training and they just got good hearted people working in that system and so forth, helping these kids with no parents, which is biblical. Amen. We are to take care of the fatherless. And the lady administrator there said she had been there a long time and they never never are able to get all the bills paid at the exact time that need to be paid or something like that. She said it's the hardest, most fulfilling job she's ha ever had that paid the least or something like that. When we feel like we can't make ends meet, what I'm trying to do is illustrate that Christians often feel like this. We must run to Jesus. We must say, give me Jesus. And what happens is we take our thoughts off of that and we put them on the one that saved us. Amen. Who, by the way, has the power 
to go ahead and work these things out, which he always does in my experience, miraculously works things out. How about when our dreams don't work out? When we have those missed expectations that I spoke about earlier. You know, when our dreams don't work out, we must say, give me Jesus. Amen. When things aren't working out, we must say, give me Jesus because God will put a new desire on our heart. Amen. He'll take that stony heart and give us a heart of flesh. as what the Bible says. Amen. He will help us to have godly dreams, to have godly aspirations, to have peace in the midst of failure. How do you think the Lord felt? He came to bring the kingdom to the Israelites and they said, no, thanks. Give us Barabbas, you know, give us the murderer. Think of he felt, you know, he went through it. Amen. Our dreams don't work out. We go to the one that knows exactly what we're going through and he will comfort us and give us a peace that surpasses all understanding. That's what the Bible says. The person we try to be isn't who we end up being. You know, oftentimes we are trying to do something, to be somebody, amen, and maybe it's a problem that we just can't always work out. And the person we try to be isn't always who we end up being. I think of the person with like a hot temper, and I'd like to think I don't have a hot temper. Of course, my wife says there's eventually a breaking point in me. She's just, she hasn't reached it yet. She's getting close though. She's getting close. But uh, I think of a person with a hot temper and they're a good person. They love the Lord. They're trying their best, but hey, they just like literally get fired up at the littlest thing. And maybe they've tried, you know, and they don't always end up being who they, 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 they desire to be. That's when we go to the Lord and we say, Lord, we're not perfect. And he just gives us that peace to help us understand that he doesn't expect us to be perfect. And Lord, we love you. And he gives us that peace to help us to understand that he loves us and on and on. Give me Jesus when things aren't working out. Give me Jesus when we're not who who, who we should be or who we want to be. Amen. You know, as a pastor of a church, a small church, you know, I'll see some other pastors and I'll have a nice suit on or a big building or whatever. And I'm just like, Lord, I'm t- how do I measure up, God? You know? And he just gives me a peace that's unbelievable that the world could never offer. Give me Jesus when we're not who we try to be. When the enemy attacks from without the household, from outside, when the enemy attacks, give me Jesus. You know, we need to be close to God so that we can get through those hardest times when the devil attacks us from outside of the household. And right along with it, we need Jesus when the devil attacks from within the household. Amen. Sometimes the most painful kind of attack comes from our own family. Amen. Amen. Jesus understands. Does he not understand? What does it say when he went home to his home area that he, not many miracles were done because the people didn't believe? Now that must have doubly hurt. The Bible also says a prophet is never uh, accepted in their hometown. I gave that quiz to one of my very knowledgeable Bible friends, and even he kind of had to chew on it for a little bit. But he said, look, yeah, this is what the Lord went through. And so as we go through hardships within our own family, you know, I I I'm, don't have a lot of experience with this uh, as a dad or as a pastor, but I've heard other pastors talk a lot about wayward children and ministering to the parents of wayward children and how hard that is, but how it's needed. Amen. And, 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 and how that tears the parents up. Enemies attack from within the household. We need to say, Lord, give me Jesus. Cause he understands he's been there. How about sickness takes us to places we never thought or wanted to go. Amen. Uh, and I just have my little world example, you know, my asthma, my allergies have been pretty ridiculous sometimes. And it's difficult. I mean, I can run a lap around a track and sound like uh, some kind of wheezing machine or something, you know, and I'm not even tired physically, but it's just the asthma is just too much. Or my wife had uh, uh, her thyroid removed and they can't quite get the medicine right for the hormones. And, you know, it just goes on. It's gone on for years, literally years, that illness. And you know, sickness takes us to places we never thought or wanted to go. You know who we need? We need Jesus Christ to help us to understand he is the great physician. He is the great healer that uh, Paul, he had a thorn in the flesh. He had a great infirmity. He prayed three times for God to remove it. You don't think Paul had favor with God? Paul had God's ear. Amen. And God chose not to remove it so that his power could be shown in Paul's weakness. And Paul said, then I'll glory in my infirmities. And so as we go to Jesus, we get proper perspective on our sickness. It may not be punishment. It may not be penalty. There may be really good reason behind it. And one of those many reasons is so that God's power can show through. And if that is the reason why he's given us this illness, then what we need to do is glory in those infirmities. We need to praise God for them so that his power can show through. Friends we trusted ended up hurting us or misbehaving. 
You don't think Jesus dealt with this? Give me Jesus. When this happens, his own disciple, his inner circle betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. How much that must have hurt, amen, for all those that that he would encounter that wouldn't believe or that would have to, you know, uh, uh, do these awful things to fulfill what God would have done, amen. When we have friends that end up hurting us, whether they be in the ministry, whether they be in life, at work, at school, we need to go to Jesus because he knows what we're going through and he can relate to it, amen, and he can give us peace and comfort and give us discernment on what to do beyond just forgiving that individual, but helping us to understand how to live, how to move forward, because he is the best of friends to us. When we're sad and we don't know why, you know, many people, gosh, many people suffer from depression. And yes, that's rampant in the ministry. It's also rampant in life. I had a friend that was a professor at a major university, state university, and they were up there, senior professor, and they were dealing with that. And they asked them, is that, I asked them, is that common, you know, to deal with the, that kind of depression in the acadi- academic world, academic, <laughs> academic world. And she said, my whole department's on medicine. My whole department's struggling. You know, there are many people, not just the professors, but everyone, you know, everybody that you, you see things in the world. And again, you have disappointments and you have stress and you get depressed. You know, I went through a depression in my late twenties, you know, I had lost some good friends. They didn't die. It just the friendship fell out the bottom of the uh, hole, whatever you say, the friendship was gone and broken, bad breakup, all these things. I, you know, you don't want to real nothing. You're not getting pleasure from anything and you don't want to be around anyone at that time, at that moment, what you need, what I need, what we need is Jesus Christ to bring that peace that surpasses all understanding to our hearts, to bring that purpose that only he can provide, that that vision that he gives us, amen, through his word, the great commission that gives us a reason for living and gives us a joy and puts us around other Christians and the Holy Spirit is then enriched. And we have that Holy Spirit kicking within us as it kicked in Elizabeth as she saw Mary with uh, with um, pregnant with Jesus and Elizabeth was pregnant with John and the Holy Spirit kicks. We have that Holy Spirit. That's like when, again, you, you don't know someone at all, but they're a Christian. They have the Holy Spirit living within them. You're around them five minutes and you're just blessed by the fellowship you have. And all of a sudden that sadness goes far away. When we're sad and we don't know why, we need to say, give me Jesus. When we see the shape of this world and wonder what the point is, we need to say, give me Jesus. Kind of goes along with the last one. But we need to go to the Lord as we see the world waxing worse and worse. We realize the time is coming and so someone that like a bystander to see the world getting worse and worse would say, this is bad, right? And it's not going to be good for me, right? If you're living in the world, but as a Christian, seeing the world wax worse and worse and devolving, you're saying, well, glory to God, the time is at hand. Amen. The judgment is at hand. The rapture is coming soon. The tribulation is coming soon. Uh, eternity with Christ is coming soon. Amen. Heaven is coming soon. God's rich reward is coming soon. Amen. All of the good things, all the wrongs are going to be re- made right. Christ will rule and reign. We'll praise him for an eternity. Amen. We'll live with him for an eternity. That is what we get when we get Jesus in our hearts and our minds. And finally, when it feels like all that I've mentioned today happens at once, some people are dealing with all nine elements at one time. Whew, it can be hard. We just need to go to him. And the world will tell us to do anything else but go to him. But understand 1 John four nineteen: we love him because he first loved us. We love him because he first loved us. We understand that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet at war with him, the Bible says, we were enemies to him, amen, he died for us. Sometimes I don't want to give my enemy a ride home. I don't want to give my enemy a pat on the back. And Christ died for the world, many of whom would refuse that free gift of salvation that he so patiently endured to give to us, dying a death more brutal than anyone had ever died. He did that and was risen three days from the grave so that we could have life. He did that. He loved us that much. So we love him in return. Psalm 126, five through six, very important verse as we close out here today. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And those sheaves would be like full crops with him. 
and we're bearing that precious seed as we are sharing the gospel, are we witnessing to others, as we are edifying the saints and loving others and serving God and doing all that God wants us to do, inevitably we face so many obstacles, as Christ did, as Paul did, as all these people mentioned today did, that we'll sow tears, that we will tears will stream from our face. God knows it's happened to me many, many countless times, amen. Even today, even today, I, I wasn't crying, but I was very hurt, something uh, trying to share the gospel today, and, and, and I was just brokenhearted by what I had heard had happened with that uh, event. And I know yet that it says that he that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Amen. That means a fruitful crop. It's coming in time. Amen. Understand, you sow in tears, you're going to reap in joy. And that is God's word. That is God's word for us today. Thank you for listening. Again, when in doubt, give me Jesus. Take care. God bless. Amen.